Here I'm punching through that papilla, sounding to bone, so we're measuring the distance from the alveolar bone to the tip of the papilla. We're also measuring the distance from the alveolar bone to the base of the contact point. We're also following these patients radiographically as well. So we take a small three millimeter punch biopsy, usually from distal to the second molar. The biopsy is placed in a little vial sent to the laboratory. It takes two to three weeks to create a cell line and approximately four to six weeks of incubation to generate 20 million cells per ml. Before these are delivered back to us, they are, are banked and they can be kept virtually indefinitely in, in liquid nitrogen, allowing kind of a, a fountain of youth effect. It's kind of neat, you know, that I could take my daughter's 17-year-old fibroblasts and we can then bank them and then when she's 40 and she wants to do something about that crow feed, she can use then her 17-year-old fibroblasts. They are then sent back to us in a, in a little thermos and if they, again, what we have here is not collagen. This is 99.5% is pure fibroblasts and if they're injected within the first, 24, the first uh, 12 hours, they're 95% viable. Within the first uh, 48 hours, 85% viable. But, you know, I don't think there's a, a dentist in the audience that wonders, okay, how are you going to inject that into the papilla and make much of a difference? Because all of us have injected local anesthetic in papilla, and you know that you can't get much volume into that bound down tissue. Well, of course, we face that problem as well, and in an effort to, to overcome that, we created what we're terming the papilla priming procedure. Again, those of you who do surgery, you know when you see that patient at seven days, especially if you've done a graft, the graft is swollen, maybe the interproximal spaces are feeling great, and you, you feel like you're a hero. Well, you also know that that swelling goes down. How can we then use that transient phenomena and turn it to our advantage? So we're going in at the alveolar crest with an Orban knife, basically pivoting that off of the alveolar crest, creating a little space. We then go in with a curette and follow the alveolar crest to the lingual, again, just creating a space here, then taking a 12B blade and going down the papilla, not excising through it, but going down toward the tip so that we have somewhat of a little T lesion. What that allows us to do then is to create a little space here and allow our injection to get into all the components of the papilla, the bone, the uh, periosteum, and the soft tissue components. So if you follow this papilla priming procedure over time, here it's at day zero, here we've completed the procedure I just showed you, and you note now at seven days you have some tissue swelling. But if you don't do anything, at 21 days it's all back to normal. Again, I think if we think about what's going on here on a wound healing level, it might make it more sense. If we think about what the phases of wound healing, that typically most people think that wound healing has three distinct phases, the inflammation phase, granulation tissue formation phase, and matrix formation and remodeling. And when you look at a temporal example of this, it looks highly structured. But in reality, in nature, these different phases can overlap a great deal and the time necessary for these, each of these phases can change a great deal. So can we manipulate this then to our advantage? Well, if we do our papilla priming procedure, within seconds of our papilla priming procedure, plasma proteins, primarily fibrinogen, coats the wound surface and the process of wound repair begins. Within an hour of that papilla priming procedure, we begin the early component of the inflammatory phase. Neutrophils begin to come into this area, beginning to engorge the lesion, and within 12 hours, we see swelling of the lesion beyond baseline. So we now have swelling in our papilla. Also at about 12 hours, we're seeing the production of the natural fibroblasts to begin to increase. At three days, we move from the early to the late component of, of the inflammation phase. You see that we continue to maintain swelling over baseline, but it's looking a little bit different. We're finding that the neutrophils are being replaced by macrophages, and the macrophages are producing uh, growth factors that are supporting matrix deposition, fibroblast production, angiogenesis, and we continue to be swollen. At around five days, we begin to enter into the granulation tissue formation phase. The natural production or increase in the production of native fibroblasts begins to peak at around five to seven days. 
and along with that peaking of fibroblast, the collagen accumulation that comes along with it begins to plateau. Then we begin to see wound contraction and at 21 days, the wound is healed. And in our case, because this was a controlled surgical insult, we're back to where we were before. Well, how can we take this and turn it to our advantage? As a rule of thumb, most people feel that the amount of tissue you either gain or lose in a wound depends on the length of the granulation tissue formation phase. For example, in a, in a, a wound where tissue is lost, generally you have a very short granulation tissue phase. And the bottom line is that the production of, of native fibroblasts and the collagen accumulation can't keep up with the amount of tissue lost in the wound and you have a net loss of tissue. If we could do something to expand that granulation tissue phase, then theoretically we could end up with a greater amount of tissue at the end than what we had at the beginning. And that's what we're gonna to try to do by infusing the patient's own fibroblasts at certain points during this healing process. So we do our biopsy, we do our papilla priming procedure, and we time our first injection at five to seven days. We time it at five to seven days because that's the point at which the body is beginning to the native production of fibroblasts is beginning to wane. So we want to infuse it with either an injection of 20 million cells per ml of fibroblasts or with our placebo. Here's what it looks like. This is, happens to be the, the second injection on this patient, and it looks very much like what you would see when you inject local anesthetic. Keep an eye on the papilla. You see it begin to blanch as I'm injecting the cells into the, the papilla here. I find that uh, I can inject uh, somewhere between point, uh, 3 to 0 0.4 mLs into the papilla. That translates to about uh, uh, 6 to 8 million cells a million fibroblasts that we're injecting into the papilla. Now, we're not just injecting it once, we are dosing this. Uh, dosing schedules are common in medicine and, and, and uh, uh, tissue engineering, not something we typically do in dentistry. But again, we're timing these at around seven to 10 days. We're coming back and we're hitting these papilla again with another series of injections, trying to extend this granulation tissue phase out and trying to gain tissue. Now, if we look at the medical literature using this material, uh, this is a slide on, on dermal depressions where they've, you know, taking dermal depressions, they're injecting the same material into the dermal depressions, and there, here's a biopsy at six months. You see here more fibroblasts, more collagen, no signs of inflammation. They've taken these same cells in animal studies, labeled them, and found that the cells are still present and active at five months, producing fibrinogen, elastin, uh, glycaminoglycans, collagen, increasing the dermal thickness. And, and where they've taken punch biopsies in humans, they find the dermis is thicker. Mechanism of action is that these fibroblasts, they, they are incorporated into the natural architecture of the dermis and then begin to either stimulate native fibroblasts to produce more collagen or go under, undergo nascent production of collagen themselves. So our experimental concept is that we're going to come in and we're going to infuse the patient's own fibroblasts at critical points, hoping to increase the granulation tissue formation phase and result in more soft tissue growth in the papilla region. We're following these patients at an acute endpoint of four months and then following them to 12 months. We're looking into that for two reasons. We want to see what does what we get at four months, does it, do we maintain it to 12 months? but also theoretically we may see an increase from the four month to the 12 month even though we've not done any other injections. Again, if you look at the dermatologic studies and some of the plastic studies that they follow for six months, they find that they are getting an improvement at the six months from what they had at the three months even though no further injections took place. Again, the idea is these fibroblasts are injected in, they undergo one or two mitotic replications, whatever the, the, the host needs, and then they set and, and produce de novo production of collagen, either sustaining or perhaps even improving the result over time. I'll just share with you a few cases that we have. Uh, this is a, a four-month uh, post-third injection. This is how the patient presented initially. You can see the papillary insufficiency, and you can see uh, where we're at here. Another patient three months after the third injection. Again, you can see the blunting of the papilla here initially, and you can see what we're getting as it's filling in here three months after the third injection. Again, another patient baseline 
at third injection and two months following the third injection, seeing a nice progression of tissue fill into the papilla region. Another patient looking at baseline, uh, almost complete uh, blunting of the papilla here. You see it starting to fill in at the third injection. This is two months post third injection. And note not just how the tissue is coming toward the contact point, but note what appears to be the volume increase. You know, this is a three dimensional increase, not a, just a two dimensional change. Another patient, baseline, three months, and pretty much complete fill of the papilla. And again, a significant volumetric increase in the papilla two months post third injection. And the patient that I showed you initially, here she is two months post third injection. And you can see the change that we have at this point. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, what's our new grafting instruments going to be in the future? And I think as far as conclusions, the uh, combination of the TCP plus recombinant PDGF in intrabony defects appears to be a very positive thing. Uh, the study, six month study, showed that we have uh, statistical improvement in cow gain at three months, more rapid cow gain, and it's maintained over time. That our bone growth is certainly affected by this in a positive way. I look forward to, to using this on, on my patients in the future outside the study. Uh, if we look at the growth factor plus scaffold versus connect tissue graft, you know, we don't know. Looks interesting. Uh, check with me next year and I'll tell you about that one. And same thing with the autologous cultured fibroblasts. This is really looking at something completely different than we've done in the past. Looking at, at it in a different way, I think we're, we're going to be doing that in periodontics. Uh, we're going to be managing things in different ways than we've done in the past. And hopefully that will result for not only growth areas for our specialty, which we certainly need, but also, and more important, predictability for our patients uh, in ways that we couldn't have, had, have imagined years ago. So it's been my pleasure to uh, uh, be here with you this morning. We appreciate you coming out on the last day of the meeting, and I look forward to any questions that, that you may have in just a moment. I want to thank Dr. McGuire. I want to thank all three speakers for just tremendous presentations and really showing us how bright our future is and uh, these novel applications. If Drs. Ginobili and Cochran uh, will join us up, I'll take the liberty of asking uh, one or two questions, and then we'll open up uh, to other questions from the floor. And maybe since uh, start with Dr. McGuire, um, have you, in regards to this uh, papilla technique, Good one job. of my questions would be: Great. Have you seen any risks or adverse events either with the papilla priming procedure or with the treatment? And then also follow up at this early phase in the study, do you have any radiographic, what, at what stage do you think you might see any radiographic changes, either positive or negative, if there would be? We haven't had any adverse effects at all. Uh, you know, you're injecting the patient's own cells, so, so you wouldn't think that, uh, that you're going to have any problems, and, and we certainly haven't. Uh, and also in the, the study that was done prior to ours, there was no adverse effects at all associated with, with the cells themselves. Uh, the papilla priming procedure is, is such a controlled surgical procedure. We're not removing any tissue at all. And, and we did a number of these before we started the study just to make certain that uh, we're trying to, you know, perfect this and make certain that we were, we were achieving what we wanted and not noticing any tissue changes at all. You end up with exactly what you had uh, uh, at about uh, a month. Uh, and as far as, as radiographic changes, we, as I mentioned, we have 20 patients in the study and we're, we made radiographs at, an, at initial and then we're making them again at four months and 12 months. We only have five patients that are at the four month point. So just and so we only have those patients and, and uh, I just eyeballed the radiographs and, and right now I'm not really noticing any change, but we're going to look at them a lot more, uh, 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 we're going to do a lot more than just eyeball them. I think with any of these new therapies, one of the uh, certain things that we all want to know is doing no harm and with the levels of risk with different therapies. There's, in the lay media, with, over the past couple of years, there's been some issues on the, uh, with gene therapy. Can you relate to that, Will, and give us some feedback on you know, where are we at with gene therapy today as far as what are the uh, reality of risks either in therapies outside of our specialty that we'll be looking at or with the types of applications that you're specifically looking at and sort of put it in perspective for us? Sure. And in terms of uh, gene therapy as it is right now, I mean, certainly this is the primary uh, concern of any new technology is to really establish the safety and to 
look into you know any potential adverse events that can uh, be related. Um, the case of a death resulting from gene therapy was associated with an intravenous infusion of a virus you know, containing a transgene. And um, so there are those risks with that type of delivery. What we are looking at is using a transient type of delivery, and actually that uh, wound healing profile that uh, Dr. McGuire showed, I mean, I think it's very important to look at the cascade of events as we deliver these uh, genes or growth factors and whatnot, that they somewhat line up with the wound healing response. And so uh, one of the advantages of using gene therapy for wound repair is that the expression profile is very short-lived, it can do its business in terms of tissue regeneration, and then the, the, eventually the genes are lost. And so it's not a permanent, you know, most of the approaches that are looking at uh, in terms of safety using gene therapy are a transient delivery. It could either be a plasmid DNA, a non-viral approach, or a uh, viral approach. And so the use of the adenovirus, for example, is the most common vector and uh, its genome has been easily manipulated and it's never been shown to be associated with any type of uh, tumor genesis, anything like that, because the genes never uh, attach to the chromosomes of the cells. They always remain episomal or extra chromosomal, so the daughter cells don't produce uh, the genes. So it's only the cells that will actually touch them. Obviously, this is a major area that uh, not only the Food and Drug Administration, but there's a Center for Biologics and Cell Therapy, CBER, um, a governmental agency that evaluates any gene therapy technology. So we'll see, we'll, we'll see where it's uh, headed. Thank you. Uh, one other question for, that I had for Dr. Giannobli was in relation to the uh, cartilage like tissue that you uh, noted in that model and the endochondral type of ossification, which appears different than what we've seen in other uh, oral applications with other BMPs such as BMP2, whether it's in, in the sinus or within critical size defects in the mandible. Uh, can you give a little more enlightenment on why you think that is or whether you think it's uh, t truly, have identified it as truly cartilage or is it more of a cartilage-like tissue? Yeah, so it, as we all know, the mandibular bone growth and development occurs via intramembranous bone formation. So to see cartilage there, that would not certainly be a, a typical